Um, don't test me, I'm not going to remember the names. <laughs> um, but it's definitely a pleasure m meeting you. And, uh, you know, I was asked to come and talk, um, and I, uh, I was going to be really well prepared. I was going to have this big map of Kenya and some artifacts I have. But I think I lent somebody my Kenya map. You know, people are always asking me, can I borrow the map? Because they know about it. And I uh, can't find. But anyway, we'll, we'll talk in general. I think the first thing I want to do is just kind of quickly give you the, a little history of Kenya. And uh, I'm sure you probably could Google that and get some. But I, I'm going to give you from my perspective, you know. Um, you know, Kenya, I'm going to start with the colonial period, you know, the 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 before the, the colony was created in 1920 by the British. Before that, it was a Portuguese, the, the, the Portuguese had come. And before that, the Arabs from Saudi Arabia had come to the coast of, coast of uh, Kenya and actually established settlements. And they actually did slave trade from there. And if you go to Mombasa up to today, you will see what they call Fort Jesus. It's called the Fort Jesus, but it's a big fort on the, on the coast where they transported slaves. But those slaves didn't come to the Americas. They actually went to the Arabia and the Middle East and so on. And, 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 um, I, and it's very interesting because today if you look at those countries, you really can't tell who, who was a slave and who was not. Because although they, was, they captured them as slaves, <coughs> when they brought them to their homes, they actually made them part of the family. So they integrated. And so they are just, you know, like if you look at one of the, uh, the, the princes of uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, he is black. But there, they don't call him black. They don't recognize that as that. So that's the difference. When the slaves came to America, they were put aside. They were segregated. They were not, you know, they were, you know, so that's the difference. But anyway, uh, so there is Arab influence on the coast. They had the Portuguese that came and settled down there. But the biggest thing was the British. They came and they made it what they called it, a plateau protectorate, which means they are protecting the, <laughs> the country. But really what they did was take it over. And uh, they brought settlers, people that came to farm the country. It's a beautiful farming country up in the hills. And we have areas that are called uh, the Kenya Highlands. They grow wheat, all kinds of stuff. It's a beautiful farming, you know. But they took all that, pushed all the Africans out and made it into, you know, and that became the biggest contention uh, all through the colonial period because um, the Africans particularly, and we'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the languages, particularly the Kikuyu for the British. In fact, they had a big movement, very famous movement. Really what started what they call today terrorism, that's, they started that and it was called the Mau Mau the Mau Mau uh, fighters. And what they did was f fight the British everywhere they could. They fought their, their f the farmlands. So the farmlands had to be surrounded by moats and all kinds of things. So it wasn't a very pleasant time in Kenya. But um, eventually, they, they had this guy called Jomo Kenyatta. And I don't know, you may have heard of him. He's called the father of, uh, of, of Kenya because he went when he was in prisons by the colonialists but when he was released he went to britain and uh, he he had um, rallies you know it reminds me of sanders you know he went around the country <laughs> he is an african but he was holding rallies in england and he, what he said is i'm a british citizen so you know i can come here and talk to you about what i see is wrong and he actually told them that, told them what the settlers were doing in Kenya. And that's what really started the movement to give Kenya its independence. 
And Kenya got its independence, we call 12 12, this December 12, 1963. So, you know, when you compare with the US, how long the US, US has been free for what, 300 years or something? Uh, so, Kenya is a very young country in that sense, you know, politically and so on. Um, um, th during that colonial period, of course, they were trying, the British were trying to. Um, grow the country, you know, and one of the things they had to do was build a railroad. And the railroad was from, going to be from Mombasa, which is the coast, up to the country. And that's where Nairobi, the capital city, that's where they were going to end up. So that's how uh, Nairobi was, you know, like central place where they were going to meet. And it started like a little village and then it just mushroomed. Today, if you see it, it's a, a big city with slums at one end, big high rises at the end, other end, co uh, companies from all over the world. Um, but it has a lot of the city problems that you see anywhere else in the world, probably even worse uh, because of the way uh, it, it grew up, it, it was grown, you know, it, it grew up as a, as a city. But building the railroad meant that they needed labor. And they couldn't get the Africans to work on the railroads. So what they had to do was go to India and bring Indians to come build the railroad. So now in Kenya, there's a big contingent of Indian <coughs> people who call Kenya home because they came, you know, maybe like the Chinese did here in the US, they came to build the railroad. And uh, for a long time, they were the merchants. They are the ones who, who did the trading, you know, uh, and so on. So um, when they were fighting for the British, the Africans were fighting for the British, uh, they had what they called a council, which represented the people of the country. And what they had done was they had, they had like five people representing the, the white settlers they had one person rep representing the Indians and one person representing the Africans. Now, the Africans were 95% of the country. <laughs> the, other, the other group was um, like 3% and 2%. So it just didn't make sense. So that was part of the, you know, but the Indian influence is still very pronounced in Kenya. And, you know, if you go there, you, will, you will see quite a bit of that. Um, okay, now, and then uh, one of, so that's really the history, and, uh, and now Kenya is into his fourth president, who happens to be the son of the original man, Kenyatta, you know, Jomo Kenyatta, you know, his son is called Uhuru Kenyatta, and he's now the president, and he, he just, you know, He's about, I think 2017 is supposed to be the time they start the new elections for another five-year term. It's usually a five-year term uh, for presidency. But it's been very fairly stable, and, um, and you know, they have a new constitution that they are working on. They, they have counties. I, I look at it and I say, there must have been quite a few Americans behind this constitution. <laughs> because everything is county and uh, all kinds of things that you hear. Uh, but what they were trying to do was, the way the country was set up, all the power was at the central government. But now what they've done is tried to disperse that to the people at the local levels. You know, of course, now you have to have the money go to the local level, so that now that's a big contention. How much should stay at the at the central level, how much should go to the, to the county. So they are still working those issues, issues out. Um, any questions about that? Any, you know? Okay. Um, Socio, you know, Kenyans are very friendly, you know, very friendly people. Um, you know, they really take you in, you know. Uh, and, um, <coughs> And especially in the Christian faith, you know, they consider you a brother and a sister, brothers and sisters in Christ. So, you know, that's the way, they, you know, normally they're going to treat you. And, you know, when, 
when you know that's the hardest part is that everywhere you go, as soon as you walk in, they're offering you tea, they're offering you something to eat. You know, and you are saying, oh, we just ate that. Oh, but just have a little bit, you know. It's <laughs> uh, so you have to pace yourself, you know. <laughs> don't go there and be, eat everything because at the next step, stop, you're going to be offered something. And it, it would look a little rude if you don't accept something. You know, but obviously, you know, if you have like health issues, you need to express those. You know, I, I can't have that because, it, you know, it affects my health or something or another. But generally, try and sip a cup of tea. You know, it's, tea is very safe because it's already been boiled. And <laughs> the only thing that's in it is tea, you know, uh, and they put sugar in it and milk and so on. Um, Usually Kenyans, uh, you know, they, they, they are not very good at hugging. And, <laughs> you know, usually they offer you your hand and you shake, you know. And sometimes, in, uh, depending on the tribes and where you go, uh, in the central uh, uh, parts of uh, Nairobi and so on, they just, give you, whoops, they just give you your hand and shake it. But in some of the other countries, they actually offer both, you know, they put their hand like this and give it to you to shake. It's a sign of respect. And sometimes they even bow, you know. But the difference is, you know, like the Kikuyus were very, they were, they were very, um, you know, almost democratic in their way of life. So, you know, there is no need to give somebody too much respect. I mean, yeah, you know. But in some of the other areas, they came from kingdoms. They had kings and their chiefs. They were very, you know, integrated this up and down. <clears throat> so, so, you know, when you met the king, you bowed down or you, you know, or you shook his hand or whatever it was. And so as a, res as a measure of respect, they, they would do the same thing. Uh, you know, and that's just for you to know, so that when somebody hands you both hands, you know, <laughs> you know what that, that is about. Um, the other thing about social issues is uh, budget and time. Uh, in general, time is not very respected in Kenya, and it's not, a, it's not from a bad sense of, th they just don't have a sense of time. Uh, essentially. I mean, there's no rush. Why are you rushing to get to anything, right? So uh, when, when Judson tells me, oh, the meeting will be about four o'clock, that means I can come anytime till seven. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's about four o'clock, you know. Um, uh, so you have to be patient, you know. You, you're going to have meetings that are supposed to start at certain time and they will be forever getting started. And, uh, and it's the same thing with budgets, you know. The, in, in, in Africa in general, money is to be used for the need, the current needs, you know. It's not a question of saving you know, you know, so this budget telling me, well, we have this money, but we have to put it aside and then you have to spend it at such and such a time. It's not a very, it's not a, an automatic thing in their way of life or the way they've been brought up. Um, and I think especially those people who do projects with the Kenyans find that very frustrating, you know. The other thing is communication, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, you be writing emails till you are blue in the face. <laughs> it's like nobody is responding. And it's not that they don't mean ill. It's just that now the idea is, oh, you asked me that question, but oh, we have to get together. We have to have a meeting. Oh, let's get this committee together. And that, of course, takes time to answer questions and so on. And uh, uh, I'll talk to you a little more about that. But so in terms of time, budgets, communication, you know, you have to be patient again, you know. Now, you know, you still have to push. I'm not telling you accept it completely, but I'm just saying that if you are stymied, just understand what's going on and you still have to keep trying. <clears throat> uh, dress. Um, you know, in Kenya, women have normally should be wearing dresses. They don't like pants, especially if you go into church. 
you know. Now, for you guys, you're going to be working on a project, so that's different. But if you are invited to church, you know, the idea is wear a dress. And, and they, they don't particularly like these short-sleeved uh, blouses and, you know, showing out, you know. I don't know where Obama got that. She does. <laughs> Mrs. Obama wears hers like that. You know. But in Kenya, you know, I mean, they're, they're probably not going to say anything, but I'm just saying it's, you know. Um, uh, men should wear trousers. And, you know, if you go to church, they literally expect you to wear a jacket. Now, you know, you know how hot, like, in, when we went in February, it was hot. And, uh, and uh, some of us were outside. But they still wore their suits and their ties, you know, the, or at least a jacket anyway, you know. Now, the pants, is, um, it comes from a colonial understanding because a lot of people, um, you know, it's surprising Africans don't wear shorts. Hardly, you are hardly ever going to see an African wearing shorts. But that comes from a colonial time. The, the British wore shorts, I mean pants. And then the Africans couldn't wear pants because that was a status thing. They had to wear the, you know, the, the, the shorts. So now that they got their independence, it's like, psh, you know, you're not going to wear <laughs> any shorts. And it, it has just permeated that way. I don't, you know, by now, I think even the generations have probably forgotten about why they wear pants. But it's very rarely you're going to see an African with shorts. So, uh, but they accept, they accept Europeans wearing shorts quite often. They, they don't, you know, it's like, psh, do whatever, you know. <laughs> um, but again, w w when I say dress, I'm talking more about when formal church, church events. Uh, Christian life. In general, you're going to be invited to things and me, little meetings and everything. Uh, I think you should learn a couple prayers. <laughs> because essentially, sometimes they would just point at you and say, oh, would you please pray for us? And it's like, uh-oh, so if you're not prepared, you know. So it's, it, it, I mean, you don't have to have long prayers, but I'm just saying it's, you know, just a prayer that you can at least be able to present when, when, when you are pointed out. Or they may ask you to lead a, a, a little session with a Bible verse or something, you know. Not so much preach, but, you know, uh, I'm just telling you sometimes. Some of you may never be asked. But they especially the youth, if you meet with the youth groups, they are most likely going to say, hey, can you pray for us? And also, the idea also of, um, um, witnessing, you know, the, when you meet the most Christian, African Christians, you, they will tell you, I just asked you to introduce yourselves and you gave me your name, but you didn't say anything else, you know. You meet an African Christian, they're going to say, my name is Timothy Ngari, and I am saved, or I am, a, you know, I met Christ at such and such a time, and I believe in him, and they kind of confess their Christian life uh, in addition to their name. And, and I'm not asking you to do that, I'm just be aware that that's how they're going to pretty much say, you know, I'm a, um, this is my name, and you know, I met Christ in such that, and I have followed him, and I try to confess, and so on. They, they quote unquote, witness why God is good to them, you know, what God has done for them. And uh, uh, so, you know, just be aware of that. Now, drinking, smoking, you know, those are considered sins. And so, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know. That. I mean, it's good that they don't encourage smoking or drink. And I drinking, I'm talking about alcohol. Uh, and uh, in some places, even things like dancing and playing cards also are considered uh, sin. And the reason for that, is particularly cards, is for cards for a long time were used in gambling. So, you know, we're here. In fact, uh, I can tell you for myself, I had a hard time doing my, some of my statistics class because they would always bring these issues about cards. You know, how many cards are this? How many cards are that? I had no idea. 
because when I grew up, my father would not let us uh, play cards. And, um, and the reason was those cards always led to gambling in, in, in Africa. Quite a, that's, you know, I didn't know you could play just games to play for enjoyment, you know, so on. Uh, dancing, uh, my father at first was very much against dancing, you know. And my sister who follows me challenged him one time. We, we, we were in a prayer group. She was the bravest. She could always talk to him and say whatever came to her mind. The rest of us just <laughs> accepted whatever we were told. But my sister, her name is Esther, she said, you know, Dad, I don't understand why you say dancing is a sin. You look at David, you know, he danced for the Lord, you know. So if you are dancing, so my father said, well, I don't know whether the dancing they do is for the Lord, but I'll give in on that one. <laughs> Leave that alone. Uh, so um, that's more about Christian life. You know, they have um, uh, the women's guild, the men's group, just like we have here. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, they have the sessions and so on, uh, like we would have here. Um, the other thing is, there's so many needs. You know, you, you go to Kenya, even I go to Kenya, and I, you just feel it because there are so many needs. Um, um, uh, people who walk up to you and ask you for money, they will ask you for, they, they think you guys are millionaires, you know? And I, it's, um, and sometimes they would tell you stories that really touch your heart. But I think, you know, the thing to remember is, you know, don't commit yourself to anything, you know, don't, uh, you know, especially some of those, some of them can be very unreasonable. And, and sometimes, you know, like when we went, uh, we had uh, one of the guys that was uh, our guide, his son had, um, was going blind. And uh, they, I forget what the disease is. But what they had said was to raise money so they can send him to India because now India is more advanced in a lot of the medical fields. Or, you know, so if they sent him to India, there was a possibility they could save his sight. So now, you, you are really touched by that. You are there trying to do other things, and you're being pulled this way. And so we had to really uh, say, well, let's do our job. And we didn't promise anything. But some of us, when we came back, we, you know, we did send him a little money, and I mean, it wasn't that much, but I mean, at least, even if it was 200, 300 dollars, at least they helped into that cause. But while you are there, you really want to avoid, you know, and people are going to come and give you their emails, because now when you come back, they will write to you and say, oh, my friend, you remember me, <laughs> and so on. So yeah, take the, the email, it's fine to be friends, you know, but uh, just remember that, uh, you know, that, that you know, and I think that sometimes, uh, even for me, becomes real difficult uh, dealing with, you know, some people want school fees. You know, education in Kenya, you know, is, uh, you pay for it at, at the beginning. That's the British way. You paid till you got to high, 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 what they call higher school. When you went to college, college was free. But to get to college, you had to pay. And that has pretty much continued now. They've, they've tried, uh, and they are doing that now where <clears throat> they are saying the, the first, fifth through sixth grade is free. But there are so many fees attached to this whole thing that, you know, the, 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 that essentially is not truly, quote, unquote, free. But anyway, uh, I just thought I'd mention that to you about you know, the idea that, you know, there are so many needs and how you have to uh, kind of, you know, uh, listen, you know, but don't, you can stress yourself taking it all in. And, you know, sometimes, you know, so they, they may not they approach each one of you. I'm not saying, you may go there and nobody approach you. I'm just saying that there is a likelihood among all, all of you, somebody is going to approach you with something like that, yeah. Um, 
Um, and, and then modern, uh, modern things is, is Kenya is it's just amazing in terms of phone, phone use. I mean, it's probably the most advanced phone use in the, in the world, they've said. Uh, and they started it as an experiment. And the idea was you have cell phones and, and they put all these uh, um, the towers. towers all over the place. And what has happened, even old grandmas, way up in the country, they have their little cell phone and they can communicate. But on top of that, it's a form of transferring money. So if you are in the city and your grandmother needs money to buy uh, uh, chicken feed or whatever, you can get on the phone and send her 500 shillings. And she can actually instantly go over there, go to a kiosk and get the money out. So um, they've try they are trying the same thing in India. But it's, it's been very successful in the last uh, 15 years in Kenya. Uh, you know, they use Kenya as an example. Of, uh, or, of that, uh, you know. Um, emails, again, the, the, the more educated, uh, you know, people use e will use emails. Uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, at the, uh, again, these are people that are going to college or even high school. And recently, WhatsApp. Is <laughs> I don't know whether you've had, everybody is on WhatsApp. You know, I get calls from people on WhatsApp. And you see it's free, and you can send pictures, you can do all that. So they are really into that, and it just kind of, you know, just flabbergasts me. It's like, you know, I get a call from uh, Reverend so-and-so, and I look at it, and it's on WhatsApp. And uh, they got hold of my cell phone number when I was there, and so they just, you know, use it. Um, so overall, uh, in conclusion, I would just say, uh, really, don't stress. <laughs> Try and relax and, uh, and, and, you know, have fun. Uh, you know, you, you have an attitude of respect towards the Kenyans and uh, show them Christian love. And, um, and, you know, if you are able to take a safari, uh, see Game Preserve, you know, and... Um, there is a, a, you know, Kenya, you know, I studied the history of Kenya at, um, at the colonial time, but Kenya has a history that goes to prehistoric times. You know, they said that's where they discovered the first men or whatever, you know, or whatever the, the time is. So while you're in Nairobi, if you get a chance, you know, stop at the, the, the Liki Museum and see some of that uh, part of that, you know. So it, it's very, very interesting. And, um, you know, but it's a varied country. It has so many languages. They say there is 60 languages. I think there is more like 40 main languages. And Swahili is the main language, and then Swahili. Swahili and English are really the official languages. But uh, everybody else speaks, you know, I am a Kikuyu. I speak Kikuyu. My wife is uh, a Kamba. That's a tribe now. And she's, she speaks Kamba. Uh, you know, I have friends who are Luo, and they speak Luo, they, that's their language. But the, our common, all our common is the Swahili or English. It, it, especially in the cities, mostly you hear Swahili. Swahili is very popular. Uh, but officially, you know, for official documents and stuff like that, it's mostly English. Um, any questions, anything else I can amplify? Um, okay, some practical questions they were asking me, and I didn't remember from our trip. Okay. Do you recommend getting um, some Kenya currency here or waiting until we we'll get to the country? Um, Normally, I, don't, I wouldn't try to go through all the trouble of getting the currency here. If you are in Nairobi, you can get uh, Kenya. Bank. Yeah, you can go to the bank, or you can use your credit card right at an ATM. I use my... Michigan first credit card in, uh, um, in Nairobi, and I can go to the ATM 
and, and get money. Now, it just depends on your bank whether they charge you a lot of money. Uh, first, uh, my credit card doesn't charge me too much. And I know that um, I think it's Chase or Bank of America doesn't, you know, if you use their cards, they don't charge you to use the ATM. But when you go to any ATM in Kenya, you're going to get money in, in shillings. So, you know, I'll put it in there and it will bring it up and it will say you can get a maximum of 40,000 shillings. It sounds like a lot of money. <laughs> That's like 400 bucks. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 and then you can take it and, and use it. So, yeah, I wouldn't go through all the trouble of carrying cash to Kenya. And the other thing, too, is that if you take your, sh your dollars, you, you know, don't, don't take anything less than $100. That's right. Yeah. New yeah, new, the newer. Have to be new. Right. <clears throat> yeah. If you take $100 or even uh, they, they have money changers everywhere right. too. Yeah. So you can walk up to them. Sometimes they will give you even a better rate than a bank. You know, which is okay. I mean, you know, it's fine. Especially if you are just in Nairobi. They will oh, definitely. Yeah, you never pay anything that they ask. You know, I, I, you know, a hotel room you can buy, of course. But I'm just saying if you go to buy a... Um, an article. Usually, they, especially when they see you're American, your price is going to be way up there. Sometimes what we do is um, um, they get confused by somebody like me. So, you know, I'll go there and I'll say, hey, how much is that? And they look at me and they figure I'm American. And they jack up the price. And, I, and then I talk to them in in Swahili and say, hey, hey, who, when I fikiri mimi nini, you know, what do, who do you think I am? You think, you know, and they say, ah, okay, 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 well, mwananichi, mwananichi means, oh, countrymen, okay, then I'll give you a better price. So, you have to barter, you know, and, and the other thing, especially in some areas in Nairobi, you have to be, watch out, they mob you, you know, with things, you know, and, uh, Sometimes that's difficult to take for, for especially for something. But you, have, you just have to be tough, you know. I, I don't want, I don't want it, I don't want it, you know. But as soon as you say, oh, I want that, then everybody who has one of them <laughs> items yeah. is going to come to you to give you a, a lower price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But definitely, the point is, whatever you are buying, normally don't buy, you know. And if you can use Kenyans to buy things for you with them or go with them and let them butter for you. That works out better. But some people, I know some uh, Americans that are very good at oh. buttering. <laughs> yeah, they are almost like born into it. So it depends you, on that. Feel free to walk. Well, that's why I said there's like 40 tribes, but they are kind of split up, you know. So like the Kikuyu, Kikuyu and Luo are the major tribes. Uh, Kikuyu is mostly in the central. And they have sub-tribes. So like you hear people saying Kikuyu, Embu, and Meru. Embu and Meru are tribes, but they are close to the Kikuyu. So a Meru can actually sort of understand the Kikuyu and the Embu. You know. So you can say the Kikuyu is a tribe, but normally they combine the three and just call that a tribe. And, and, you know, so, but there is, there is like 40 of them. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. yeah.